Okay, on the to uh, Curtis. Curtis Sattel <clears throat> joins us uh, from uh, the University of British Columbia. He's distinguished university scholar and world scholar at the University of British Columbia. His research focuses on viruses and their diversity, evolution, and function in the global system. And uh, that's something um, that I've been curious about for a while. <clears throat> um, how how does the how does the 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 world of virus interact with the world of uh, living things? Uh, he's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and American Academy of Microbiology. And again, uh, if you go to lasertalks.com, you'll find extensive bios and a link to his uh, uh, lab. Okay, all yours. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. I just, uh, do you see that my pointer here? I'm just wondering on the screen or do I need to use something else? Yes, I see it was very teeny. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> so I'd like to uh, thanks very much for inviting me to uh, talk here. It's it's uh, it's fun, and I've certainly learned a lot, and and probably a talk that I wouldn't have heard otherwise. Um, and I just wanted to start by um, acknowledging that uh, the University of British Columbia is situated on the unceded ancestral and traditional lands of the Musqueam Nation and the Coast Salish peoples, and so we're really privileged. Uh, I'm very privileged to live here and work here and uh, be able to um, carry out our research. So I want to start today, when I was thinking about uh, what I was talking, going to talk about today, I wanted to kind of uh, expand on something that I've been thinking about for a while. So I'm certainly a, a strong believer in that, it, that viruses uh, essentially are the puppet masters uh, of life on the planet and many of the other processes as well. And by the end of today, I'm hoping to convince you at least that the role that viruses play in terms of things like global car uh, global biogeochemical cycling and carbon cycling may be extremely important and perhaps provides a way that we can uh, perhaps uh, respond to increased uh, atmospheric CO2, for example. Um, I often say that um, without viruses, we would not exist. And without viruses, we could not survive. And I say we could not exist because many of you will know that viruses comprise about 8% of our own nucleic acids and they encode for essential proteins. For example, like an essential protein in the placenta of mammals. So there would be no mammals if it wasn't that one of our ancient ancestors co-opted viral genes and repurposed it. And we could not survive. And, and we could not survive because viruses are essential in terms of uh, keeping the wheel of life moving um, in terms of regenerating nutrients and maintaining biodiversity and many other processes that we might talk of. So viruses, in, in essence, I like to think of, they're not only our enemies, but they're also our friends. So if we were an alien and we were coming to Earth and probing it, probably the probe would hit an ocean because that's most of the planet's surface. It's pretty unlikely that it's going to hit uh, what I would call a charismatic megafauna, like a, a whale or an elephant or anything like that. It's probably going to come back with a sample of water. And if they did so, they would look at that and they would conclude, wow, you know, life on Earth is certainly entirely microbial and it's mostly viruses. So this is what a drop of seawater looks like if you stain it with a uh, nucleic acid. In this case, uh, this is Yopro, which is staining uh, double-stranded DNA. And this is all these little dots that you see here are actually uh, double-stranded DNA viruses. And the ones that are a bit larger, like these guys here, and maybe some of these yellow ones here, are actually um, prokaryotic cells, bacteria primarily. And every now and then you'll see something like this, like a protist. Essentially, this is what most of the world's oceans look like. If we look at it uh, kind of in a general sense, typically there's more than 50 million viruses in every milliliter of coastal seawater. And every time you go swimming, for example, you would end up swallowing more viruses than there are people in North America. So several hundred million viruses just from the amount of water that you take in your mouth. So. I think one of the points that I, I try and make is that these viruses certainly don't harm us. And most of the viruses that we coexist with in the planet, uh, in fact, are 
not interested in us at all and are uh, involved in other kinds of processes. However, if we look at it in terms of abundance in the ocean and we look at, at where most, most life forms are, it's by far dominated by viruses. So this little pie chart here, about 90% of the biological entities in the oceans would be viruses, about 10% or less are prokaryotes, uh, bacteria and archaea, and then um, maybe a, a percent or a couple of percent would be protein. So this is really what life looks out looks like in the ocean. And we could say, well, why does anybody really care? So if we look at it in terms of biomass, so this is actually living material. So if you were to take everything that you might recognize in the ocean, whales, fish, crabs, seaweed, even crustacean zooplankton, and you were to put it on a giant balance, all of that material would actually weigh less than probably 5% of all the living material in the ocean by weight. About 95% or so of the living material is actually entirely microbial. If we look at it in terms of, of heritable units, so in terms of genomes, about 90% of the marine genomes are viral. And these marine microbes, produce about half the oxygen in the earth. So many of these microbial cells, in fact, are photosynthetic. They would be cyanobacteria primarily, but also small eukaryotes. And one of the remarkable things is that about 20% of these microbes are killed every day by viruses. So that means about 20% of the living material in the weight, by weight in the oceans are killed every day as a result of viral infection. And so if these microbes are producing half the oxygen on the planet, and they're also responsible for about half the respiration, and viruses are killing about 20% of that material every day. Clearly, they're gonna have large consequent effects on things like biogeochemical cycling and carbon cycling. So this mortality not only drives uh, global nutrient cycles, but it's also really important doing things such as maintaining biodiversity. And I'm not going to talk about that today, but that's a really important aspect because viruses tend to be very, very specific in terms of what they infect. And in the microbial world, they tend to be strain specific. So even not uh, uh, targeting an entire species, but just individual strains of those species. So if we look at, at viruses, even though they're incredibly small, and so just to give you a perspective, um, I was giving a talk one time and I had to say, well, how am I going to explain how big a virus is? And I didn't really think about how to do that. And I thought, well, let me let me just think about if if I was to scale a virus to the size of a pinhead, for example, and I would scale myself by the same amount, how tall would I be? And it turns out I would be about 50 kilometers tall. So if you scale the virus to the size that you could actually see it and you scale the person by the same amount, that person would be about 50 kilometers tall. So they're incredibly small, but they're incredibly abundant. Another statistic that I like to say is if you took all the viruses in the ocean and you stretch them end to end, how far would they go? They would go about 10 to the seven light years. So it's absolutely remarkable. Even though they're incredibly small, they have incredibly important functions and they're uh, incredibly abundant. So what I want to try and convince you today is that they also play this really, really important role in terms of carbon cycling on the planet. So if we look at, at viruses and, and say carbon cycling in the sea, and this is an old paper now, so the numbers are, are somewhat dated, but but uh, conceptually they're, they're okay. Um, we have, uh, so these processes down here where we had viral lysis and viral lysis kills cells, obviously when it kills cells, it releases organic carbon, so POC we call particulate organic carbon, and also releases dissolved organic carbon. And so these numbers here, about 700 gigatons in this case, right? So there's about 700 gigatons of dissolved organic carbon in the ocean, right? And so that's how much, uh, and viruses are, are feeding that pool kind of continuously. If you look at it uh, in a numerical sense, that's about equivalent to the amount of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, this number now has been going up, of course, this number is from 2005, so that's a long time ago. This number now is up around, oh, 835 or 840 gigatons. So the CO2 in the atmosphere 
is continuing to rise. And that's uh, a trivial amount compared to the CO2 in the ocean, which is primarily not as CO2, but as bicarbonate, but it's in exchange with CO2, which is about uh, 38 teratons. So, so, so this is when we look at carbon in the planet, uh, sort of that, that mobile carbon, if you like, the carbon that moves around rapidly and can move from one pool to another. Um, these are very, very major components. So if we, again, look at, at that dissolved organic carbon, so this pool here, and kind of look at it in a little bit more detail, it's, it's kind of actually quite remarkable because if you look at it, so remember the concentration is about the same, the amount of carbon and dissolved organic carbon in the ocean is about the same as the amount of um, CO2 in the atmosphere by, by total weight. But if you look at how that carbon is broken down into the ocean or different pools, we can see that some of that carbon is, is very labile um, we have something that we call, well, there's actually very labile dissolved organic carbon. That's things like amino acids and nucleic acids and, and sugars and things like that, which turn over extremely rapidly. Um, so th those are in the orders of minutes to hours. And then we have something that we call semi-labile dissolved organic carbon, which persists from weeks to months. And so you can see there's a small pool up here of that. We have what we call semi-recalcitrant, which might be decades old, which is another pool. And then we have what we call recalcitrant dissolved organic carbon. And that recalcitrant dissolved organic carbon is by far the largest pool. So if you integrated, you know, the area under the RDOC box here, and you compared it to the amount of carbon in each of these other, if you integrated the area under these shapes here, of course, most of it is this recalcitrant dissolved organic carbon. And the remarkable thing is the average age of this, because you can take this and you can see 14 data, is about 6,000 years old, okay? So this is really interesting because this is organic carbon then that's basically not accessible to respiration, right? It can't be broken down very easily. And so it's basically inert. And so one thought is that, wow, if you could actually increase the amount of this dissolved organic carbon in the ocean, this would actually be a great storage device if you could convert CO2 into this, recalcitrant dissolved organic carbon pool, then essentially it's inert and is not going to be biologically active and it's not going to be chemically active. And so is actually essentially just stored. And if you look at it from a global perspective, this is a, um, uh, some, a plot of different oceans. So here's uh, latitude, right? So this, if we just looked at this one right here, this is the Pacific Ocean, right, from Antarctica all the way up to the Arctic Ocean. And then you can do the same here for the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian Ocean back here. And so what we have here are concentrations of this dissolved organic carbon, again, much of which is recalcitrant uh, in these different areas of the ocean. And so you can see that it doesn't matter where you go in the ocean, you have these large pools of dissolved organic carbon. So, Years ago, uh, when this fellow was a postdoc in my lab, uh, Stephen, ha uh, Stephen Wilhelm, who's now a, a chaired professor at, at University of Tennessee, um, we came up with this idea. He said, we can calculate, you know, how much of this, of the primary production in the ocean, for example, is being recycled into the dissolved organic carbon pool. And what does that represent in total uh, relative to primary productivity? And remember, I said that, you know, photos, half the oxygen in the planet is produced by photos, microbial photosynthesis in the ocean. And so that means that if that's the case, then, then half of the primary productivity on the planet is also attributable to, to these microbial things. And so we, we had pretty good data uh, that we had collected on, on how much of this biomass is, in, is lysis occurring in. And so when we actually said we did a little box model here, um, we calculated that about six to 26% of the primary productivity in the ocean actually moves through this process that we call the viral shunt. And so that viral shunt then is moving organic carbon from these different pools, like pool of phytoplankton, the primary producers, the grazers are, are zooplankton, for example. So those are, are uh, heterotrophs, right? And we have heterotrophic bacteria, which again represents uh, most of the biomass in the ocean. So we have carbon moving from all of these pools as the result of viral lysis. Uh, 
So essentially what we're looking at is, is in this kind of cartoon here is we have viruses that are coming along. They're infecting a, a plankton cell, a phytoplankton or a bacteria plankton and, and releasing dissolved organic matter and also really releasing particular organic matter. That's worked on by enzymes and especially uh, UV radiation breaks this down, pushes more of the particular organic matter into the dissolved organic matter pool. That gets taken up by bacteria plankton, which are heterotrophs then, and they release CO2. But they don't only release CO2, so it's not all process, process into CO2. Some goes into biomass, right? So in other words, producing more bacterial cells. Another is going to be released into this dissolved organic matter pool and it's going to stay there, right? Because it's it becomes more kind of it's more recalcitrant and can't be broken down very easily. Some of it's going to be broken down quickly, others is going to be um, uh, stay there for longer periods of time. And so again, if we kind of look at this in another cartoon, so we have this, this process, the viral shunt, then, which is essentially catalyzing then the transformation of carbon into this particular and dissolved organic matter pool, right? So from the phytoplankton, but also from grazers and the heterotrophic bacteria are undergoing uh, viral lysis and producing dissolved organic matter. And of course that's released as CO2, some of it, and some of it is released back into the dissolved organic matter pool. So if we kind of put this into another cartoon, this is a, a model that, that again, this, so I'm, pulling things together from, from various sources to kind of think about how viruses, uh, what we might be thinking about them doing uh, now, right? And, and how we might be able to take that knowledge and, and understand how um, dissolved organic matter is accumulating in the ocean and where it's coming from. So this is called the microbial carbon pump. And so the idea is, the question here is, where does this recalcitrant, this long lived dissolved organic carbon where does it come from? How is it produced? And so the thought is that, again, so you have a process here in which you have organic carbon produced from phytoplankton and zooplankton. And I would argue that much of this is the result of viral lysis, right? So we have viral lysis of bacteria, but we also have viral lysis of phytoplankton and zooplankton. And that gets, that organic material gets broken down by heterotrophic bacteria, of course, you know, that's their classic role, right? Bacteria are decomposers, they break things down. So as they break things down, uh, some of that goes into bacteria, biomass, some of it's respired, but some of it isn't broken down very easily, right? So some of it just is left behind. And so the more times this dissolved organic carbon goes through this, essentially um, this process, right? So it's concentrating this recalcitrant dissolved organic matter. Right? So you're getting production of carbon, it's accumulating in the environment um, because it's essentially what you've got is fractionation going on. You've got this fractionation going on and every time it passes through this microbial carbon pump, if you will, it becomes fractionated and the stuff that can't be broken down just gets left behind and gets concentrated. Okay, so you could, you could imagine this, this mechanism here of increasing the amount of recalcitrant dissolved organic matter. So I'm going to change a little bit here and talk about another observation that we made, which was which was um, kind of strange. I, you know, sometimes some of our um, papers take a long time to publish, and and this, as I tell, this is one of the longest. It took about twenty years, and the reason why is because we were we were on an expedition in the Gulf of Mexico. And we came across a bloom in the ocean of a phytoplankton, which was essentially monospecific, right? And we knew that there was lots of viruses which infected this particular primary producer. And we thought, what a great way to try and figure out how much mortality is actually going on as a result of viral lysis. So we did a series of experiments in which we concentrated viruses and we either, we concentrated them or removed them from, from water. We have processes where we could do that. And we looked at the effect of varying virus concentrates uh, on the amount of mortality that was going on in the phytoplankton community. And the thing that was really bizarre is that when we took all the viruses out, photosynthesis stopped. And the more viruses that we added back, the higher the primary productivity was. So this was counterintuitive. It was, 
Well, it was the opposite. When there were no viruses, there was no mortality. And we added more virus, or no measurable, no detectable mortality. And when we added the viruses back, we got faster and faster primary productivity. So things grew faster and faster. And so because we didn't have a mechanism for this, I just didn't want to publish the paper until we had some sort of explanation of what was going on. So, so over the years, we kind of worked and poked away at this. And so one of uh, the people that did work on this quite a bit was a PhD student in my lab at the time, Emma Shelford, and a collaborator in Denmark, Matthias Middelbo. And we had data in which we, we thought that the, the process that must be going on, the, the, the lysis of cells must be releasing something which is fueling the primary productivity in the system. And so what was that? And so, and so we, we looked at, um, we, we did these experiments where we, we, again, added viruses back or we removed them. We had data from the Indian Ocean, an area in which is very, very nutrient poor and the chlorophyll and algal concentrations are extremely low. And we also had an experimental system pretty close to where we are here at the University of British Columbia called False Creek, which is not a creek. It's a false creek. So in fact, it's marine, right? It looks like a creek from the outside, but it's actually a marine embayment. And so, again, we either added viruses or we removed or deactivated the viruses. And when we did that, again, with the viruses, we found in every case that we got more chlorophyll A, more more photosynthetic biomass or more cells. We could actually count this, the small um, microbial algae that were produced. And it didn't matter whether it was the Indian Ocean or these two experiments in False Creek. When we added viruses, we ended up with more primary producers. So, so what's going on here? So how is it that when you add an agent, an obligate pathogen, which can only reproduce by lysis, by lysing cells, how is it that we end up with more photosynthesis. And so the story, it actually turns out what's going on is that when we added viruses, and again, these are data from False Creek, so the same experiments and the Indian Ocean, we found out we had more ammonium. And so that was, again, a little bit puzzling because, of course, viruses don't do any mineral processing, right? They infect cells. They don't have metabolism on their own. So whatever it is, they must be somehow affecting the metabolism of organisms and resulting in more ammonium production. And why is ammonium important? Well, it's important because primary producers in the ocean, in many areas of the ocean, their growth rate is limited by the availability of inorganic nitrogen, right? So they're not limited by, they, they can make all the carbon they want, right? Because they can photosynthesize and there's no limit for CO2 in the ocean because of all that dissolved inorganic carbon is bicarbonate. So, so what they are short of it are nutrients like ammonium, like nitrogen. And so, so when we're adding the viruses back, we're ending up stimulating ammonium production somehow. And ultimately that ammonium is what's limiting the primary production. So that's stimulating the growth of the phytoplankton. So, and again, with viruses removed, the ammonium dropped down very quickly and was there was was not regenerated it didn't appear so what was going on in the system so so here's our explanation for what we think is going on so again viruses are very specific in terms of what they infect so there's certainly sus certain susceptible cells which will be um, in which viral infection will occur so again so you have your viruses going in infecting the cells and as we saw with the um, uh, as a result of lysis and viruses, we get production of dissolved organic matter. Now I'm going to give a little bit of chemistry here, not very much, very simple, just a little bit of stoichiometry. So if you take a, bacterium, a bacterial cell on average and you look at the amount of carbon atoms relative to the amount of nitrogen atoms in a cell, it's about four to one. So there's about four carbon atoms for every nitrogen atom, for every atom of nitrogen, organic nitrogen. And so when the dissolved organic matter pool is produced, the assumption would be that this would also have a C to N ratio of about four to one. And so that's what you could think, well, for bacterial growth, then this is what we would need. We've got four atoms of carbon for uh, every atom of nitrogen for a, heter for a heterotroph to be in balanced growth. But of course, heterotrophs also respire. So they need more carbon than nitrogen. So if you feed a bacterium with bacterial lysate, 
it's going to be in carbon deficit because it has to respire in order to grow. And so there's not enough carbon relative to nitrogen. And so the ballpark number would be you need twice as much carbon. So you need a C to N ratio of about eight to one in order to have balanced growth. And so it's quite short of the amount of carbon that's needed for plant balanced growth. So what happens? So this dissolved organic matter is taken up by resistant cells, but because it needs more carbon, it deaminates the dissolved organic uh, material to get at the carbon in order to grow and respire. And it releases that material as dissolved organic nutrients. And so that's not only true of nitrogen, it's gonna be true of phosphorus and iron and all of these other essential nutrients for growth. And that carbon then is gonna be left behind. Some of it's gonna be respired as CO2, obviously, because they have to respire and some's gonna be released as dissolved organic carbon. Some of which, of course, a small portion of that's gonna be recalcitrant. So, and again, so the uninfected cells, again, they will become infected. Some, and again, so you, some of these will be susceptible. Other viruses will infect it. And so you just continue this cycle. And as so, in other words, you stimulate primary production by recycling the inorganic nutrients. So that creates photosynthesis because, because the cells are not limited by the availability of light for energy. They've got all the energy they need and they need all the carbon. They can make carbon through photosynthesis. So what they're short of are the inorganic nutrients. So they ultimately, that gets recycled faster and faster. So the wheel spins faster and faster. You get more and more photosynthesis. You get more and more production of dissolved organic carbon. So this is something that we've termed the shunt and pump. And so the idea is, I won't go into too much details here, but you have heterotrophic microorganisms, and this is their C to N to P ratio here in atoms, and the same thing for phytoplankton. These become lysed, right, as a result of viral infection. They pass through the viral shunt, and this, through the sort of stoichiometry of this concentration mechanism, they end up, when they're lysed, they produce these inorganic, these uh, uh, like nitrogen, phosphorus, these nutrients, which are rapidly recycled and consumed by other microbes and leaving behind the carbon and ultimately, or some of the carbon, and that ends up being the concentration mechanism. So, so just to kind of finish up here, um, so reducing atmospheric CO2, this is uh, from a report of the of National Academy of Sciences said that if we're going to reduce carbon in the atmosphere, ultimately we have to be able to employ the oceans. And so there's all these schemes going on, seaweed farming and, and cultivation and electrochemical scubbering and carbon capture and adding uh, alkalinity to the environment, a whole bunch of things to try and increase the amount of the balance of the CO2 that's in the ocean uh, relative to that which is in the atmosphere. All of these things actually have significant problems of, with them, of course. One of the things with, if you produce a lot of biomass and you sink it, so what's going to happen? The heterotrophs are going to consume it. You're going to use up the oxygen and the oceans are going to go anaerobic. And so that's what we're seeing already, this really big expansion of oxygen minimum zones in the ocean or things like dead zones, right, where we have lots of productivity going into the ocean. So these have uh, consequent effects. On the other hand, if you could do something like just increase how fast the wheel is spinning and produce more and more RDOM, you could actually potentially trap this in as biologically inert organic carbon. So I'm just going to finish it up there and just say, again, so these are some ideas that I've been thinking about in terms of how viruses might contribute to um, carbon capture in the ocean. Uh, I'm not proposing any uh, geoengineering of the planet at this point, but I think it's really useful to understand the essential role that viruses play. And this is one of them. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Curtis. Um, and thank you for introducing us uh, to viruses in, uh, in the ocean. We tend to think of viruses as airborne, as flying in the air or sitting on the ground. <clears throat> in a sense, you just made the world even more dangerous. Now we know that when we swim, we are swimming, swimming through millions of viruses. Um, okay, I was checking. So we have three questions from the audience, and then I have more general questions about uh, viruses. <clears throat> um, why are there so few pandemics if there are so many viruses? <clears throat> uh, so why are there so few pandemics? Well, it depends how you define a pandemic and who you are. I think pandemics are occurring all the time with, with, with organisms. And, 
And so I think over evolutionary time, I mean, one of the things that I say is that, you know, 99.999% of every species that lived is now extinct. We know that from the fossil record and, and through, uh, and through uh, genome sequencing, for example. And so I think that, that pandemics are always happening. And, and the fact that we're still here today is, is that we're in some sort of balance with, uh, with the viruses that affect us. That said, I mean, we're also incredibly lucky that uh, the viruses that have emerged recently you know, don't have an incubation period of four weeks and then they're lethal because if, if they were, then you know, that would lead to extinction, right? So I think, uh, so, so pandemics are occurring all the time in organisms. We see it in microbial communities, but again, viruses tend to be very selective. And the fact that, that we're here today is that, that complex interaction between our immune system and, uh, and, and our whole microbiome, for example, which is also uh, interacting with, uh, with the viruses around us. Again, I think as viruses as being symbionts with us to a large extent. So many of the viruses which are in our own bodies are probably helping us. And I'll give a very, very quick vignette, which I just because I think it's so cool. So every time we breathe in, we're breathing in thousands of viruses, right? So we just inhale them. There's thousands of them in the air around us. And those are bacteriophages primarily, right? So they're gonna be bacteriophages. They're not interested in us. But there was a great paper uh, years ago published by Forrest Rohrer's group at San Diego State University. And they found that these there's viruses that get stuck, you know, in, in our lungs with their little feet out. And they're dependent on us to inhale bacteria because it's those bacteria that they infect. So we concentrate the bacteria so that the viruses can, can replicate. So, so in a way, that's another first line of defense for us are the viruses, the phage in our lungs, which are infecting the bacteria that we breathe in. So that's an interesting. Exactly. Let, me ask, let me ask you the third question before the second one. Is the percentage of viruses to living beings the same among terrestrial beings, approximately, of course? So the again, depending on what you look at terrestrial, if we look in soils, it's even higher, right? So, so the general rule of thumb is there's about an order of magnitude more viruses than uh, the living organisms that they infect, right? And so, but for... And, and, but most of these, of course, are, are going to be bacteriophages. And the next most abundant one will be viruses, which are infecting proteins, because these are by far the most abundant um, uh, organisms on the planet. So um, for terrestrial systems, again, when we look at soils and things like that, yes, the numbers are, are, are very high. When we look at things for like human pathogens and things like that, I would say those numbers are extremely difficult to come by and, and largely unknown. How can viruses exist and replicate if there are so few living organisms in the ocean? Um, I guess, yeah, there are a few living organisms in the ocean, but of course they're very big. So it's a lot of living cells, right? Or if we're talking about the charismatic megafauna, I think I mean I think that's incredibly interesting because uh there's lots of different ways that, that things get passed along. And and I mean the oceans are are you know, again, they're not different than terrestrial systems, but sometimes you don't think about these things. Like there's some organisms which are always going to be rare, but they can be locally abundant, like the barnacle that only grows on the back of a blue whale, right? They're never going to be very abundant, but they could be locally abundant on the back of blue whales. And so, so in order for viruses to spread, there has to be an association with the organisms, right? And so, so one of the really interesting things is these, these turnover times in the half-life of viruses in the ocean. And so we've done lots of work on that and others have as well. So I think there's, so for, for the charismatic megafauna, just like all viruses, as soon as you get high abundances, high populations, viruses will spread rapidly. There was just a massive die off of, of seals, I think in, in uh, that I saw in Patagonia uh, recently, right? And so when you get, again, large colonies of mammals or fish, schools of fish, uh, viral infections can spread incredibly quickly. The bottom line is that we know very, very little about this. Right now, we have a, a project that we've been working on, a couple of projects. One is on starfish wasting disease on the coast of, of North America here, in which one of the iconic uh, keystone species, a, a sun star, is almost extinct. It's actually, it, you know, which is one of the most abundant ones, and they clearly have some sort of pathogen that's spreading amongst them. And we've also been looking at mass mortality events at oysters as well. So for most of these cases, we don't even know what the pathogens are 
that infect it. The only things that are widely studied are things that are involved with human health, agriculture, and aquaculture. And, and we know that whenever we put organisms together in large concentrations, we always have trouble with pathogens. So. <clears throat> yeah, you, you have another question from the audience, but before we go there, I, I want to make sure I have time to ask my own questions, They're a little more general. So I want to, uh, first of all, um, <clears throat> COVID generated a lot of interest in viruses. I assume it also somehow boosted research on, uh, on viruses. Um, what have you learned? What have we learned uh, since 2019? Have we learned something new about viruses or we still pretty much know and don't know what we knew and didn't know three years ago, four years ago? Right, so that's that's a, a, a huge open-ended question, obviously, because you can look at, at one level and say, what do we know about the molecular biology of coronaviruses and things? And of course, we know enormous amounts that we never knew before because of all the all the efforts that have gone into understanding it. But I think what it has done is given us a lot more appreciation of the diversity of the virus world and how little we know about what's out there, right? So we still don't know the origin of um, of the, the virus which causes COVID, right? It, it's speculated that it was something related to pangolins in Asia or something like this, but but we don't know. And as we start looking at, at other organisms, we just realize how little we actually do know. We've had a project where we've looked at, for instance, uh, viral discovery in, in salmon. And that's been incredibly interesting because one of our, our colleagues and collaborators, uh, Christina Miller, has this array, uh, this high throughput array, which has every known pathogen for salmon on it. And so what we were getting is salmon, which, which showed signs of viral disease, but were negative for any of the of the pathogens that were on her array and so we did uh, you know deep transcriptomic sequencing on those virus uh, on those fish and discovered you know about 10 viruses which were in many cases completely unknown to fish including a coronavirus or a, a nidovirus which is related to coronaviruses and, and which were previously unknown and when we started looking at those and because we're collaborating with with this fisheries group they have 25,000 fish archive that we can go back and look at that. And so what we actually got was these beautiful genetic distributions of viruses, which we didn't know exist, but were clearly widespread in fish populations. In some cases, these viruses are clearly associated with disease, but in most cases we don't know because one of the really, really mm -hmm. hard things to do is organisms in the wild, which become infected or sick with a virus don't persist, right? And so we're always in this kind of, you know, did they get sick and die or did they recover, right? Because they have complex immune si or systems as well. And so in many cases, we don't know. So we're looking at those kinds of questions in a, you know, in a variety of organisms. One of our projects right now that we're working with, uh, with one of the PhD students in my lab is looking at, at uh, viruses infecting crustacean zooplankton, for example, because that's the link between the primary producers in the ocean and things like fish. And so what we've discovered again is that there's all of these viruses, which we never knew existed, which are inf infecting crustacean zooplankton. So when you ask what we learned, I think what we learned in spades is just how little we know. And I think uh, it's still a little bit of a frustration that, that we're so focused on medical virology. So if you look at, you know, and, and it's understandable, if you look at the amount of money and resources that went into um, trying to figure out ways of, of dealing with, with COVID-19, it's, it's billions of dollars. If you go and look at how much money was invested in, in um, viral discovery and things that we don't know, it's probably less than before because everything was just pushed into COVID research. Right? So, so, you know, there's, there's still this kind of, I think we're very, very poorly prepared for the next pandemic. I mean, we have absolutely no idea of the viruses that are in, there's some surveillance programs going on in Africa and some going on in Asia, but very, very little, right? And, and ultimately this is where the next pathogens are going to emerge from. There's, there's, I mean, smallpox, all of these things, we, we have a, a wonderful record of the emergence of smallpox, which is thought to have gone from a mouse to a camel, or sort of from a camel to a mouse to a human, and they actually know how it moved from uh, from Asia 
uh, to uh, Africa and then ultimately spread through the human population. But that's the, a, another example of an emergent pandemic, right? And so there's there's many examples of these sorts of things, and and uh, but we know very very little about what's in the wild. Uh, <clears throat> back to your research, uh, I think your research <clears throat> shows us that there's uh, this kind of symbiosis between the living world and the world of viruses. Uh, I'm curious. I, I know that. It's, this is pure speculation, but what's your guess? Who came first, the virus or the living cell? <laughs> uh, it's it's somewhat speculative, but not that speculative. And 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 I think and so the, the data suggests that they both emerged at the same time. And whatever gave rise to 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 cellular life, viral life was was there already. So so what we can see is that we know you know if you look at the emergence of cyanobacteria about three billion years or so ago is the viruses which infect the cyanobacteria were already there, right? So whatever existed predated that, right? So the viruses were already emergent. We can do that by looking at the evolutionary history and the you know in and, and the phylogeny of these different types of viruses. So so I mean I who came first? I think it, it's whatever that primordial soup is that gave rise to life it emerged incredibly quickly. And I think one of the really interesting things that, that, we, that we forget is that for the first two and a half billion years or so, uh, life was only microbial, right? And, and, and metazoans have only been around for, for less than a million years, right? So, and, um, sorry, not a million years, for less than a billion years, right? So, so 500, 600, 700 million years or something like that, right? So. So we're very, very new on the scene. And so for the first like 3 billion years, life was entirely microbial and eukaryotes, as far as we know, didn't even emerge till quite late. So so um, in that, that whole process. So uh, there's been a long time for evolution to work together. And so there's some, some really, really cool things that have been discovered in recent years about, you know, the, the, of uh, viruses co-opting host genes, which have which they do all the time. Like there's a whole group of viruses, for example, which encode the genes for photosynthesis, right? And so when you when they infect their 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 photosynthetic cells, what you see is cellular photosynthesis shuts down and viral photosynthesis spins up, right? So so there's all of these very very complex interactions, and absolutely it, it's it we're we're symbionts, right? And I always say that you know we can't have life unless we have death, right? You have it's absolutely essential, and 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 the example that I gave is if you take viruses out of the ocean, photosynthesis stops because there's no more nutrient recycling. There's no more regeneration, right? So we're absolutely dependent on these processes. So let me let me see if uh, if if we ever get to the nearest exoplanet, uh, would you be surprised if there are only living beings or only viruses? Would you expect them to ex either coexist or neither exist so we've done work uh, you know i don't know about exoplanets that's a long ways away but certainly in our own solar system i i actually actually would not be surprised at all if if life came from mars to earth for example because it appeared so fast on earth and by the time you know earth was when earth when mars was a lovely planet to live on <laughs> in quotes earth was unlivable right it was boiling sulfuric acid and volcanic activity and 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 mars was was quite delightful right and so and we do know there's martian meteorites on earth for example which carry organic you know or carry material which are clearly from mars so so certainly it's possible that, that things got moved around and i've um you know worked with nasa and the csa or my group has and we have for uh, over the years and and i've argued that if you want to look for life on other planets and you can get a probe there you should be looking for viruses and and we published a paper a few years ago about viruses um, above the planetary boundary layer, for example, and it's amazing. So if you go above above the planetary boundary layer, so that's that area where essentially the atmosphere is not impeded by friction, right? So it moves freely. And so we just looked at the viruses that were falling out of the atmosphere in what should be one of the most pristine uh, environments on Earth. And there were billions of viruses just settling out per square meter per day, wow. right? So, so if you go to another planet, so we know that viruses are an order of magnitude 
more abundant than the cellular life. That's sort of a, a rule of thumb on earth, at, at least for microbial life. That's going to be true elsewhere as well, because evolution tells us you're always going to have parasites, right? So if something evolves, at least under a DNA-based system, as far as we know, there's always going to be something that's going to co-op that and so we should be looking for viruses because our technology now allows us to detect a single virus particle. And so if you wanted the most sensitive instrumentation to look for the probability of life, I would look for virus particles because they're, they aerosolize, you know, we're completely surrounded by them. As I say, you're breathing every time you take a breath in, you're breathing in hundreds, if not thousands of viruses. Um, and so, yeah, so it's very easy to or not very easy. None of these things are easy, but that's certainly the, I would say, the most sensitive way to try and look for it. So I would not be surprised, at least within our own solar system, uh, stuff moves around, right? So, so, so <laughs> places are inhospitable for life. Mars was one of those places that actually was hospitable before the Earth was. So, so um, yeah, I'm expecting any day for, uh, you know, one of the rovers to say, we found life. And as soon as they can figure out it's not contamination, which will be very hard, <laughs> then, then, we'll, uh, then we'll have some interesting, some interesting discussions. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we kept you long enough. Thank you. Fascinating research, both you and, uh, and Anthony. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you.